All right, so we're in section 2.3 now, and uh, <clears throat> back in section 2.2, the previous section, we introduced the idea of a limit. We talked about how to evaluate some limits using uh, graphs and tables and things like that. The issue with those techniques is sometimes they're not all that accurate. Um, using a table, for example, the numerical approach to evaluating a limit. Uh, depending on how complicated your function is, the, the numbers that you're getting in that table can be kind of misleading. Um, you're looking at the values and saying, it looks like the function is approaching such and such value as x approaches whatever. But how are you really going to be sure about that? Well, in this section, we're going to um, talk about the techniques that you're going to be using the majority of the time when evaluating a limit. And we call these things the limit laws. Um, this approach to, that we're going to talk about to evaluating limits is oftentimes called the algebraic approach or the analytic approach. So um, to kind of get into it, I'm going to throw a whole bunch of what we call limit laws at you. And right now, we're not going to prove that any of these are true, but they are kind of intuitive. In the next section, we'll talk about how you would prove that these are true. Um, but for these limit laws, let's suppose that C whenever it shows up, is a constant, just some constant. And let's suppose that we have these two functions, f and g. And uh, in both of these functions, we're going to take the limit as x approaches some other number a. We're going to suppose that the, these limits exist. Remember, we talked about in section 2.2 that limits can fail to exist for a number of different reasons. But in this case, we're going to assume that both of these limits exist. Then we're going to be able to say that these five properties, or these five laws are go always going to be true. And really what this boils down to is um, looking at the limit as x approaches a of functions that are built out of f and g in some specific way. So here's what I mean by that. Our first limit law says that the limit as x approaches a of the function f of x plus g of x is equal to the sum of the limits of f of x and g of x both as x approaches a. You can kind of look at this almost as if it were like a distributive property. It looks like that limit is distributing into the f and the g. We wouldn't really call it the distributive property, but it sort of looks like one. Um, and the key thing to remember here is that when you have these square brackets here, we're looking at f of x plus g of x, that entire thing as just one function, which we're taking this limit of. And it's the same we would get the same result as if we thought of f and g as separate functions, took their limits, and then added the results. That's what that's saying. Notice our second limit law looks very similar, but with subtraction instead of addition. Um, so don't, don't have a whole lot to talk about there. Number three, this one says that if you're taking the limit as x approaches a of c, remember c is just a constant, times f of x. So if you multiply a function by a constant, what you have is now a new function. Um, if we're taking the limit of that function as x approaches a, we would get the same result as if we just took the limit as x approaches a of f of x by itself, and then multiply that result by the constant c. So you can kind of think of it this way. Uh, constants can be brought out of limits. Constants that are being multiplied to a function specifically. They can be pulled out. Um, here we have uh, a limit law for multiplication. Compare it to laws one and two, it's very similar. The limit as x approaches a of the product of two functions is just the product of the limits of those two functions as x approaches a. In a similar case for division, if I'm looking at the quotient of two functions, f of x divided by g of x, the limit as x approaches a of that function is the same thing as the quotient of the limits of uh, uh, that, that we see here, limit of as x approaches a of f of x over the limit um, as x approaches a of g of x. And this one comes with a separate condition. We have to be assuming, if this, is, if this law is going to be true, we have to assume that the limit as x approaches a of g of x is not equal to zero. And hopefully it's obvious why that's the case. Um, if this were equal to zero, then we would be dividing by zero right here. Okay? Now, um, Let's take a look at an example. Again, right now, we haven't really talked about the limits of any specific functions. Notice that I haven't said anything about what f of x and g of x look like. So we're speaking in very general terms here. Um, and let's suppose in this example that we were given two functions, f and g, and we know what their graphs look like. 
we aren't given an algebraic representation for these functions yet, but we, we happen to know what their graphs look like. We need to find a few limits that involve these functions somehow. So let's start with this one. The limit as x approaches 2 of f of x plus g of x. Well, I could use my first limit law here, which uh, there it is. The one that we said looks kind of like the distributive property to evaluate this as a sum of two separate limits. The limit as x approaches 2 of f of x plus the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x. And now let's look at what those would uh, come out to using the graphs that we see here. So starting with f of x, where is 2? 2 would be right here. And as x approaches 2 from either direction, it looks like uh, my function is approaching this open circle here. Um, that corresponds to negative 1 on my y-axis. So this guy right here is negative 1. What about g? So g of x is here, and if I'm approaching 2, if x is approaching 2, it looks like the function is, or my curve is approaching this little cusp right here. The y value corresponds to 2 on my y-axis, so that would be plus 2, okay? So I'm using those two points on my curve, uh, or on each curve, to evaluate this. Negative 1 plus 2 is just equal to 1, so there's my result, okay? Next one, uh, the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x times g of x. So in this case, I have a product of the two functions. This looks like I need my fourth limit law right here. So I'm going to apply that. I can bring the limit in to each function independently and then multiply the results. I'm going to get the limit. This is equal to the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x times the limit as x approaches negative 1 of g of x. Okay, so now we need to find those limits. Where's negative 1 on my f of x? Well, uh, negative 1 would be here on my x-axis, and as x approaches negative 1 from either direction, um, on either side, my curve is approaching this open circle. Now, remember, we saw this back in section 7.2. Even though I have a dot up here, which would tell me that f of negative 1 is equal to 3, this would be 3 up here, the limit is approaching something else. The limit appears to be approaching 1, so this would be equal to 1. Now, what about my g of x? The g of x, as, uh, or g of x as x approaches negative 1, negative 1 is here, we're approaching this point on our curve in either direction. That looks like it's 2. So this becomes 1 times 2, or just 2. Okay? My next limit has a couple of things going on. It looks like I'm, I'm going to need a combination of limit laws 3 and 5 because I have this 3 here, this constant, that I'm multiplying my function by. And my limit laws say that I can bring that constant out. So I'm going to do that first. This is equal to 3 times the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x over g of x. And now I can use limit law 5 to bring this limit into my numerator and my denominator. So this becomes 3 times the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x over the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x. And uh, we've already dealt with the, the limit as x approaches 2 up here, so I know what both of those are. Um, f of x will have a limit of negative 1, and then g of x will have a limit of 2. So this becomes 3 times negative 1 over 2, which is equal to negative 3 halves. Okay? That's off screen there. So that's, that's um, uh, kind of an introduction to those limit laws, how we would use them in a case like this, where I'm, I'm trying to find those limits graphically, and then... Uh, use them to help me find the limits of these other functions here. Let's go ahead and move on. Okay. So uh, there's several more limit laws. We're gonna kind of we're gonna go through them uh, kind of one by one here. And again, I haven't proven any of these. Like I said in the beginning, there is a way to prove that these limit laws are true, but for the time being, we're just gonna take them for granted. Um, so this first one says that we have the limit as x approaches a of some function f of x to the nth power. 
uh, where n is going to be a positive integer. This limit law says that I can bring that limit inside the square brackets. It, this is equal to the limit as x approaches a of f of x. And then after evaluating that limit, we raise that result to the power of n. Okay, so that's another limit law that's useful. That one's um, really just a consequence of limit law three, which you might be able to see if you think about it for a moment. Or no, I'm sorry, uh, limit law number four, because exponentiation is just repeated multiplication. So it's sort of a consequence of this limit law right here. Um, number seven and number eight are the first limits that we look at where we're dealing with specific functions. Notice we're not seeing an f of x or a g of x anywhere. We're seeing a constant function c and the linear function x, also called the identity function. Um, let me talk about these ones for a second. So first of all, let's look at number seven. I'm going to go off to the side here. Let's suppose that we graphed this constant function. We know that the graphs of a constant function, if this is c right here, Constant functions always give us horizontal lines when we graph them. So if a is anywhere, doesn't matter where it is, then as x approaches a, my function never really changes. I'm, I'm a, my y value at this point is going to be c, because that's, that's where that horizontal line is. Um, notice it wouldn't have mattered if I put a over here. I'm still approaching c regardless. So that's where we get this limit law from. As x approaches a, no matter what a happens to be, this constant function will always give me a limit of c, the same constant that defines it. What about this guy? Um, the function here is the function f of x equals x, or y equals x. That function looks like a line with a slope of one passing through the x axis, or passing through the origin. So this is y equals x. Okay? Now pick any number a. Let's put a over here this time. Um, if I want to find the limit as x approaches a of this function, so we're going, we're approaching a from either side, um, find the line down here, and whether we're approaching from this direction or this direction, this is the point that we are approaching. So what is the y coordinate of that point? Well, by definition, it would also have to be a. Remember, this line is defined to be y equals x, meaning every point on this line will have the same y coordinate as its x coordinate, a, a. And that tells me, or that, that kind of tells me where this limit law is coming from. The limit as x approaches a of x is just a. In other words, you can kind of think of it this way. We plug a directly into that function and that would just give us a. Um, that process is called direct substitution. In a couple of sections, when we start talking about continuity, we'll, we'll um, see exactly what kind of functions allow us to use that direct substitution property and which ones don't. Moving on, limit law nine technically doesn't really need to be stated because it's a consequence of limit laws eight and six. Basically, if I were to take limit law 6 and use f of x equals x as my function, then I'm putting an x in here, and that's basically just giving me what I have here. The limit as x approaches a of x to the n is equal to a to the n. That, again, is like direct substitution. To evaluate this limit, I plug that a directly in for my x, and the result is, is what I see here. Same kind of thing with number 10. The limit as x approaches a of the nth root of x is equal to the nth root of a. And again, we're assuming here that n is a positive integer. Um, there's a little uh, condition that's written down here. If n is even, then we're assuming that a is positive, which we know needs to be the case because when we take, uh, if n is an even number and we put a negative number in here for x, then we don't get a real number as a result. So it's just a little condition to keep in the back of your mind. Limit law number 11 is, uh, kind of similar to this one, but now we're dealing with a general function, f of x. The limit as x approaches a of the nth root of f of x is the same thing as the nth root of the limit as x approaches a of f of x. So it's been a lot of talk about these, these general laws. We haven't done an example in a little while. Let's take a look at one. We're going to evaluate the limit as x approaches 2 of this function here, 3x squared minus x plus 5. Um, in order to do this, I'm going to use some of my limit laws. So what I have here is a difference between two terms and a sum 
also appearing in here, this plus five. Uh, limit laws one and two say that I can take this limit by first evaluating the limit of each one of these terms independently and then adding or subtracting whatever it calls for, um, whatever the results are. So if I use that, this is the same thing as the limit as x approaches 2 of 3x squared minus, I'm bringing that minus out here, the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus the limit as x approaches oops, uh, 2 of 5. I guess I didn't really need the parentheses there, but they're there now. So, um, okay. Now, in addition to that, I have 3 times x squared here. 3 is a constant, and one of my limit laws said that if I multiply a function by a constant, I can bring that constant out of that limit. So this is the same thing as 3 times the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus the limit as x approaches 2 of 5, okay? Now, each one of these limits independently, I know how to evaluate because I have laws now that allow me to do that. So, for example, up here, we see that the limit as x approaches a of x to any positive integer power is equal to a to that power, which in other words, like we said before, is direct substitution. Take that a, plug it in for the x, and that's what that limit will equal. So I'm seeing that here. Um, this will equal 3 times, taking that 2 and plugging it in directly there gives me 2 squared. Here, the limit as x approaches 2 of x. Well, we have limit law 8 telling us how to deal exactly with that limit. Again, direct substitution. Plug that number in for x. So 2 gets plugged in for x. I have minus 2. And then here, constant function. 5 is a constant function. And up here we said doesn't matter what, what x is approaching. That constant function will always end up with a limit equal to that constant. So that will just be 5. We can ignore the fact that x is approaching 2. Okay, what does this all come out to? 2 squared is 4 times 3, that's 12. Minus 2 would be 10, plus 5 would be 15. So that's our limit. Okay? Now you might have looked at a problem like this and, and thought, that seems like a lot of writing for pretty simple steps. And, and you're correct. Right now, the only reason I'm writing all of this out is because it's it's getting you used to uh, these limit laws and why why they're appearing where they are, um, but you're not going to do this most of the time. At first, you'll you'll put all of this work into writing these steps, but pretty soon we're going to see that polynomials as well as several other types of functions, um, those limits can be evaluated by simply using direct substitution. You might notice that we would have gotten 15 if we simply plugged two into that polynomial. Okay, and we'll investigate why that works in more detail in a different section. Um, let's take a look at one more, then I think I'll stop this recording here. So in this one, we're going to evaluate the limit as x approaches negative 3 of x plus 5 over x squared plus 4. So in this case, I'm going to use my, um, what number was that? I think limit law number 5, which shows us how to deal with uh, quotients really blurry there all of a sudden. There we go. So limit law number five tells me how to deal with quotients. I'm going to do that first. It tells me that I can bring that limit into my numerator and my denominator separately. The limit as x approaches negative three of x plus five over the limit as x approaches negative three of x squared plus four. Okay. Now each of these limits is being applied to a different function. So I can use my limit laws on these as well. Um, in each case, I have a sum of two terms and I can distribute that. Um, again, technically the term would not be distribute, but helps to kind of illustrate what we're doing. So we'll get something like this. Limit as x approaches negative three of x squared plus the limit as x approaches negative 3 of 4. So again, um, these are both constant functions. We know that these limits will be 5 and 4, respectively. And these two functions, x and x squared, we've already seen. You can evaluate these by direct substitution. Plug the 3 into that function directly. So here I'm going to get negative 3 for this limit, 
here we're gonna get five. Down here I'm gonna get negative three squared. And here I'm gonna get four, so plus four. What does this equal? So negative three plus five, that's two. Negative three squared is nine, plus four is 13. So two thirteenths is my answer to that. Okay, um, there's plenty more to cover in this section. We'll, we'll pick up where we left off in part two.